Okay, so welcome to the new features presentation. In it, we'll, we'll be looking at the features that were introduced in Tomcat since uh, the last presentation, which was, which was in, last, uh, in Berlin, actually, last year. Uh, it was a much funnier time, but that's okay. Uh, okay, so let me switch to that and we'll go. So I'm Remy Moshera, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I've been working on uh, Jibos, uh, Red Hat Jibos web server for a while. And I've been an Apache Tomcat committer since 2000. Uh, I have been an, an ASF member for quite a while as well. So we're going to look at a number of new features that were introduced. Basically, the most uh, obvious one is the move to Jakarta, which we'll discuss uh, extensively, but not too much because other sessions will touch on it as well. Uh, connectors and I.O. have been a focus as well. Uh, during the Tomcat 10 uh, lifecycle, we intend to do refactorings and cleanups, so we'll have a deep look at them. Uh, we've made quite a bit of uh, quality of life uh, improvements in Tomcat to make basically uh, users' life easier. Um, in the continuation from last year, ahead of time compilation and growth support has been a focus as well. So first, we're going to cover moving to Jakarta. So the first major release we'll have supporting Jakarta EE is going to be Tomcat 10.0. Uh, it's been, uh, this plan has been started uh, as a discussion on Wiki, basically, and you can now have a look at it. It will basically give you an overview of what we intend to do. Uh, the 10.0 version is going to have support for Jakarta EE9, which will include uh, multiple new specifications, so servlet 5, etc. And the thing is that there's no really new features in the new specification. It's mostly a move from the Java X uh, package to the Jakarta uh, package. So basically, Java, Java X server, uh, servlet, for example, becomes jakarta.servlet in uh, Jakarta EE9. Uh, a significant new feature, however, in Tomcat 10.0 is that we, we will have the TCK testing. And uh, since we are moving to Jakarta, uh, one thing to remember is that Tomcat 10.0 will not have direct support for Java EE8. So your existing Java 8 applications will not run without migration. So to cover that up, uh, as with uh, Eclipse, we will have a, a migration tool uh, to help you migrate your applications. Uh, it's going to be at this time a static build time tool. So you have to run uh, uh, the tool uh, on your application, your deployments, on your jars uh, to make the conversion from JavaX to Java to Jakarta. It will then produce uh, ready-to-use deployments or jars that you can deploy on Tomcat 10. Uh, we intend to support different EE profiles um, just in case. Basically, the most common one, and it's going to be the one used by default, is Tomcat. Basically, we will convert all the uh, Java, Jakarta EE specifications that are implemented by Tomcat and only them. And there's also an option in the migration tool to migrate the full EE profile. Uh, there are some packaging limitations in some cases. For example, we found out it's difficult to migrate uh, an, an uncompressed archive due to uh, API limitations in the archive support in the JDK. Uh, also, if you're using sign jars and things similar to that. Uh, it's not going to work since the converted uh, classes and text files and whatever will not have the same signature as before the migration. So moving on to 10.0, the, the next major Tomcat release is going to be 10.1, according to our plan. It's going to have Jakarta IE 10 support, which will have uh, actual new features over Java, Java IE 8. So this is a release probably most people will be targeting. Tomcat 10.0 is mostly for early adopters at this point. Um, to help support past users, uh, existing users, I mean with legacy applications, 
we will continue supporting the Tomcat 9 branch uh, with the Tomcat 910 release, which will be as a Java E equivalent of Tomcat 10.1. At the same time, we intend to UL Tomcat 10.0 because basically there's no new features, so we don't intend uh, a significant use of this release. And 10.1 will be able to take that over uh, without much trouble. At the same time, also, we intend, or maybe a bit before, uh, Tomcat 7.0 will be old. Okay, moving on. Uh, from this Tomcat 10 branch, we'll have a Tomcat 11. So the plan is then uh, to, in, to increment the major version of the Tomcat version of the Tomcat release to match the, the Jakarta E release. So basically, Tomcat 11 will support Jakarta E 11. Uh, we will have a Tomcat 9.11 to with the Java E 8 equivalent. And uh, during that time, uh, also the Tomcat 9.0 support will continue. At this time, we will UL Tomcat 9.10. It will be superseded with Tomcat 9.11. And also, uh, because we only support three version, three major uh, versions of Tomcat at the same time, Tomcat 8.5 will be old. And so on then. Basically, you got Tomcat 12 supporting Java E12 and Tomcat N supporting Jakarta EN. So first, uh, as a first demo, I'm going to have a quick look at the migration tool. Uh, the idea is to take the example web app from Tomcat 10 and do a migration process and have it run on Tomcat 10. Uh, tom from Tomcat 9 to Tomcat 10. Basically, the, the web app from Tomcat 9 will use Java X and will be for Java E8 and the migrated uh, application will be able to run on Tomcat 10. Okay. Oh, no, I need to adjust my sharing. <laughs> Otherwise it won't work. All right, I'm going to share the entire screen. It's, it's going to look a bit goofy right now. Yay. All right, so now it's supposed to work. Yes, okay, all good. So, uh, so the first step, I downloaded the Apache Tomcat Jakarta migration tool from GitHub. There's no official releases at the moment, but it will happen eventually. So the first step, uh, so let me have a look at what's there. Uh, the first step is to package, is to Maven package it. So it's building. Meanwhile, I'm going to take the, the web app from uh, Apache Tomcat 9.0 and put it in my web apps of uh, Apache Tomcat 10. So this is the web app from Apache Tomcat 9. And I've all, all already deleted the one from uh, Apache Tomcat 10 because obviously it's bundled. So it's been compiled. So first I'm going to have a look to show you what it's going to do if I try to run uh, without conversion. So let's have a look. You'll get a trace, no, it's, oh, yeah. So you can see in context startup examples failed due to previous, previous errors. If you have a look at the in the logs, there will be some error, some packages, some class not found error, basically. Uh, it's in here. No, it's not here. It's totally not. Yeah, so see, no class that's found error, Java X servlet, because uh, Apache Tomcat 10 only has Jakarta. So then we'll, we'll have a conversion with the tool now. Uh, OK, so let me have a look. Let me pick up the tool. So I'm going to use the shaded version, which is basically an all in one package with the full migration tool. Okay.
I'm going to, uh, no, yes, no, that's not that. <laughs> Sorry, made a mistake. Examples, and I'm going to migrate it to examples. Uh, migrated. All right. Then it's going to run the migration with the Tomcat profile. It's pretty fast. I'm going to delete and remove the, I'm going to remove the original one since it's useless. I'm just going to rename it. All right. I'm going to run Tomcat again. Then it should deploy properly. So it did deploy properly. And I'm going to access it to show that it's redeployed. So there and the examples, yes, are here. And so it's running properly. You can see the, the examples from Tomcat, uh, Tomcat 9 are now running properly. So, so that's uh, the way you can use that tool to just convert your applications. Uh, very complex applications have been migrated. But there are some caveats, uh, caveats uh, about uh, the packaging, basically the, uh, the lack of support for uncompressed archives has been a problem as well as signing also. So it depends on the complexity of your web app and especially the libraries that you're using. So I'm going to update my sharing now. All right. So moving on to connectors and IO, another, uh, still working? Okay, it's still working. So another big, big focus was uh, in the Tomcat 10 um, timeframe. Basically we wanted to do a big cleanup uh, and do refactorings and all kinds of stuff we, could, we couldn't really be doing in a, in a stable branch. So basically there was some uh, blocking IO refactoring. So also there was a big, um, big dedicated uh, polar just for blocking IO and the pool with uh, polars basically. And all that complexity was there because basically the polar size didn't scale properly earlier. And now all the problems have been solved. You can have big polars and it's working just fine for pulling your sockets. So all that complexity can go away and Tomcat will run just as fine. So basically we removed the terminal code with there. Also we did some simplification of tracking, reduction of synchronization and that kind of thing that was very useful. Uh, there, have been, there has been a, quite a push lately about uh, for HTTP2 reliability, lowering memory use and general scalability improvements. Uh, because well, uh, HTTP2 is quite complex. So we wrote the new, the new code and everything is mostly fine, functionally, I mean, but uh, in terms of actual scalability, it's not comparable to HTTP 1.1. So we want to basically improve it further. Uh, also some uh, useful features that was introduced is better expectation support. Uh, expectation is the HTTP 1.1 uh, feature, uh, which allows, or HTTP 2 actually also, uh, which uh, uh, allows um, server to tell the client that it can send the request body. Uh, because uh, sometimes when the client wants to send a big body, a big request body, it, it, it's good to wait, to have it wait for the, uh, for the authentication to be okay, to not send the, the body for, uh, for no reason and have it go to waste basically. So we added configuration options to uh, be able to, to allow the server to either uh, send the expectation once the authentication is complete or that is new uh, until the application, uh, the server application starts actually reading the request body. So that's a, that's a, that's fine tuning, which is on uh, which is often useful and uh, quite complex to do. Uh, configuration, yeah. So there was a big opportunity there to further clean up the connector uh, connector configuration. 
uh, we had a problem where, uh, for example, all the, the options from the connector element, uh, which um, is HTTP 1.1, are then duplicated in the HTTP 2 upgrade protocol sub element. So this has been refactored and HTTP2 will now uh, properly look up to the uh, HTTP 1.1 configuration, for example, uh, for compression. Uh, it, it saves, uh, basically it cleaned up a lot of mess and it's probably going to be much easier for you. Uh, an important new, new setting that was changed is uh, facet discarding. Basically, once uh, a once request is done, um, the objects, as the underlying objects will be recycled, but to protect the container, we, we use facet objects on top of them. And uh, that setting controls uh, if the facets are discarded after the request. Generally, it's safer to discard them, it's more robust, but it hasn't been done by default until now. And in Tomcat 10, it will now be the default. Also, it's now a, uh, an attribute on the connector instead of a system property as it was before. Uh, okay, so uh, is, this is still a work in progress, but uh, we intend to phase out uh, APR and AJP at some point. Uh, it's going to be a multi-step process, most likely. At the moment, the talk about uh, removing APR uh, has been restarted, so we'll see what happens. But uh, the thing is that at least we are doing some uh, cleanups for that. For example, we try to discourage APR use by not uh, having it be enabled by default if you install Tomcat native, for example. Uh, there was an, a helper flag on the APR li lifecycle listener, which is in server.xml, and it's been removed. Now, for example, if you want to use the APR uh, connector, you have to specify the full class name in your server.xml. It's, uh, so you, you're not going to be doing it by accident. We want people to migrate to NIO now. Uh, also, we, we did remove uh, AJP specific code in, uh, in the connector, uh, and it's now disabled by default, basically. Uh, we also tighten up the AJP connection, uh, the AJP connector default configuration. Um, basically, it's less out of the box as it was before because it's it has safety issues. So introduce, uh, we introduced some new features. Most of these are available. Uh, I think all of these actually. Yeah, all of uh, no, the, the second one isn't available in Tomcat Nine. But uh, except the second one, they're all available in Tomcat 9. So, uh, so basically, we have a better HTTP 1.1 Keep Alive uh, response header support. Uh, it's a feature which uh, allows the server to give more information to some clients about uh, the Keep Alive behavior, especially how long it will last. Because uh, although the server is allowed in the HTTP 1.1 spec to terminate the connection whenever it wants after completing a request, uh, it's it's more efficient if the client is aware of what's going to happen. It only works with certain clients, though, but better than nothing. So as a refactoring in Tomcat 10, we have more precise execution time uh, metrics now using system nano time. Uh, for HTTP 2, one important new thing is that uh, we expose proprietary request attributes now. Uh, it allows the application to know what's going on on the HTTP 2 layer. Also, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's idle timeout configuration for WebSocket sessions. Uh, a cool new feature was that um, OpenGDK 8 now supports ALPN. So Tomcat now takes advantage of that transparently, and so HTTP2 will work out of the box with OpenJDK 8, at least the new version. And also, the server certificate is uh, now exposed to the SSL support interface of Tomcat that allows uh, an application, at least a valve, to pick up at that and do something. It's been used by the rewrite valve, basically. We also support a new, uh, new um, Key formats for JSSC um, for the JSSC TLS connectors basically. 
Okay, so very quick demo on HTTP2. Basically, I, I'm running OpenJDK by default, and H2 is going to, to be supported out of the box. So I'm adjusting the thing again, sharing. Uh, yeah, your entire screen, okay. Okay. So I'm just going to start up again Tomcat. Let me clear first. All right. So as you can see, it's running JDK8. Uh, it's not running APR since Tomcat, which Tomcat native is not found. And it has uh, a protocol handler for uh, basically JSSC and IOS with the vanilla thing out of the box. And as the message said, it's been configured with ALPN. So it means it's working usually, and that is broken, but most of the time it will then work. Okay, so let me have a look at what I can I do. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, refresh that. And I've enabled, um, I've enabled logging for HTTP2. So as you can see, it's now using HTTP2 out of the box on JSSC and IO on OpenJDK8. So nothing to do. It's working out of the box. That's pretty nice. Um, yeah, we are going to discuss AJP at the end. Uh, well, AJP is secure, uh, but the thing is that uh, it's not encrypted or anything. So it's secure, but it's secure in uh, like uh, the security level that was expected uh, some time ago. And so now, we would want to encourage people to instead use HTTP for uh, proxy. Yeah, and we may talk about that later on in other sessions, that's right. <laughs> okay, so some refactorings uh, in the realm and security or, uh, area. We have uh, improved GSS and Kerberos support. Uh, that's very useful for some stuff related to Kerberos and Active Directory support. Uh, connection pooling for GenDRL. Uh, I'm intending to port that to Tomcat 9, but uh, it's missing some uh, testing, basically, since it kind of changes the uh, way the GenDRL operates. I'm a bit worried to break it, so uh, test is te testers wanted. Uh, generic principle, get password got removed. Basically, the, cre the credentials should be managed uh, by the realm. Uh, it's been considered unsafe by some users, and I think they have a point, even if it's not a big security problem. Uh, it's better not to expose um, get password directly on the principle. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, so there's now an option to persist authentication. Basically, um, basically you should just support the, uh, you just persist the current login. Uh, it works across the cluster or uh, the persistent manager, basically. So there will have been some uh, rewrite valve updates. Uh, there have been some rewrite maps improvements. Basically, you can. Uh, define uh, parameters when uh, configuring rewrite maps. That's quite useful if your rewrite map is going to have some uh, fancy features. Also, we have uh, utility rewrite maps out of the box, just like there is in mod rewrite for case modification and escaping. Uh, also, generally, there's uh, the implementation of most of the TLS environment variables for the rewrite valve. Okay, uh, one thing that was uh, quite messy in Tomcat is that uh, we were, yeah, we were doing a lot of configuration with system properties, even though they applied to components which could be using regular attributes, like for example, uh, connector configuration, there's a connector element. So there was still uh, system properties used for some configuration instead of attributes. And in such a case, uh, the system properties are now replaced with regular attributes, which is better in some way. 
Uh, usually, uh, those properties haven't been seen a lot of use, but it may impact you. So I encourage you to read the documentation, see the full list, and see if your if the system properties you were using have been migrated to attributes. Uh, basically, the most prominent one that was migrated is the discard facades, which I've already talked about. So removals, uh, we've been removing GMX Remote Lifecycle Listener, which is um, used to basically make a GMX Remote uh, connector. Uh, all the features are now supported out of the box by the GRE, so it's not needed. Also, almost removed or pretty considered for removal, I don't know if it's been removed already, it's the JFDBC realm. It's been uh, replaced by the data source realm, which is basically the same, but uh, more scalable, so it's good. Quality of life. Uh, so HTTP capabilities, um, one cool feature is that just uh, the support in conf.web.xml of uh, two uh, new elements. It allows configuring the character encoding for the request and response, default stuff. Uh, I think a lot of people wanted that. <laughs> uh, also the cookie processor now gets an instance of uh, the request and it allows much finer processing and more complex behaviors if needed. So startup speed, uh, basically there's now uh, optional parallel archive scanning for annotations. Like if you have many calls on your server, you can uh, basically, and a lot of jars obviously, because like for example, if you have a, a web app with thousands of jars, um, it can be done in parallel now. And there's also improved filtering of the jar contents. So really, if you have a, a web app with a multiple, uh, with lots of jars, uh, it will have improved deployment speed now. Uh, there's also special configuration to uh, completely skip uh, all scanning. Before, uh, it existed before, but uh, it wasn't implemented really the way it should have, and it was still doing some, sec some scanning just not the, actually the same way, but. Uh, also the standard managing a manager was persisting all sessions by default on redeployment or, or stop or startup. It wasn't so useful in most cases since, well, basically the session would have expired already or something like that. So it's not done by default anymore. So better integration, there's a, uh, the Java platform module system metadata is now generated. Uh, there are a lot of details about that in, in the Bugzilla I'm giving. And in, along the way, many OSGI packaging issues have been fixed as well. Uh, there have been uh, digester improvements. Um, the end result is that uh, digester rules can now generate Java code equivalent to the XML that is being processed. So the idea is um, uh, since uh, the digester is used to process all, uh, all configuration XML in Tomcat, uh, was to give good examples for Tomcat embedded and also to give um, uh, possibly better behavior when using a head of time configuration. Also, we did some property replacement enhancements. Uh, we, all, we allow multiple property sources to replace your properties in server.xml, for example. And also, you can now support uh, specify default values using name uh, colon dash default. So I'm going to give a very short demo on that starting to run late. <laughs> uh, yeah, entire screen. Yay. Okay. So now what I'm doing, it's going to be very clear when I show it. Uh, okay, I have configured the property source with the environment property source. Basically, it will just look up the environment properties and replace them in server.xml. And in server.xml, I have my default connector, which is HTTP port, uh, and it defaults to 8080. 
So I'm going to set that environment property, HTTP port, and set it to something else. As you can see in the configuration, it was, uh, it was running on port 8080 right now, which was the default. I'm going to try something else. I'm going to run Tomcat again, and it will use 8081 now. So it's been using the, the environment property to for the port number now. So another cool thing is that you can use multiple property sources. For example, if you have uh, the environment properties or some store somewhere for your attributes, you can then uh, configure some uh, configure multiple ones instead of having to fiddle too much. Okay. So now ahead of time and grow, that's basically the main, the last main area we have for new features. Uh, we've benefited from the new features of grow, uh, lots of ease of use and uh, basically use general usability, uh, like force Java 11 support. It's pretty obvious, but it wasn't supported before. Uh, there's really fewer major right missing items. Basically, the main one is serialization, so no clustering. Uh, we would like to get JMX support eventually. Bin info is also in interesting for expression language. Right now, it's very inconvenient to use bin info for expression language resolution with Graal, so I'm not using that. And also, the, there's limited static, static linking, which means uh, some restrictions when using Tomcat native. But all the rest has been fixed. Basically, last year when I did the, um, the same presentation, TLS in general was a big mess. Uh, you had to really fiddle around to have it work, especially in a container. It was a big mess. So due to the new, that new those new capabilities, there's no there's now Java 11 support for Grow and Tomcat. Also, Java 8 ALPN, which we've demonstrated with HTTP2, is now supported as well. Uh, also, the code generation capabilities of the digester, which I I've already discussed, basically that can be used to replace reflection, uh, uh, to replace XML parsing and reflection with uh, straight hard-coded code. Uh, it's actually at the moment it's used for server.xml and contact.xml, but not the rest. Could be used in the future for web.xml, TLDs, and whatever. I'm not really sure it's that useful, but it's possible at least. Also, there's uh, a code generation utility to replace introspection utils reflection, and that's been used in frameworks like Spring. So uh, you can use uh, code generation very easily. I'm going to have to demonstrate very quick. Basically, the use is either you're using Grow and you have want to have fun. Uh, yeah, you want your screen now, and you want to have fun with Grow and go crazy, or you just want to learn about embedded, or you want to really use embedded in your applications, but. Then you have a complex TLS configuration and just a mess. I mean, if you're going to write embedded code for a complex TLS configuration, you'll probably make a lot of mistakes along the way. So now you have a simple switch. It will generate the code, uh, the embedded code from your server.xml, and you just can cut and paste that and rename the. So you need to add, uh, you need to rename the the variables because otherwise it will be a bit messy generated code. So I'm adding generate code and basically it will generate code for that. So if you remember, I have a server.xml with which is basically the default. I changed the connectors a bit like I did a, a TLS uh, connector to basically demonstrate HTTP2 and then it have engines and an access sort valve, and then in the um, in the work directory, uh, you have now just some code that has been generated, which is basically the equivalent. So it's just a, an embedded Tomcat. So you know, it creates a server, adds stuff like list, the listeners at the beginning, uh, the data sources, and everything. So as you can see, it's just. Uh, 
straight code which doesn't use a lot of reflection. There's still some reflection left, like for example, the set properties are definitely using reflection. And uh, you can remove that using the second code generator for um, introspection utils. Uh, so the TLS connector, for example, is here. Uh, so it was using uh, the, NIO, the NIO protocol, uh, set the, the port, set the SSL config, set the certificate, set the key store file, add the certificate, add the SSL. So it's really a lot of boilerplate code. And if you have a complex configuration, it becomes a big mess. Basically, just for that simple out-of-the-box uh, configuration, it's al already 100 lines of code, and you really can't remove much of it. So, so it could be a help if people want to use uh, Tomcat embedded more. Also, for Graal, it also generates a loader for the uh, generated code to avoid reflection at this at this step. Uh, also, if you can see, it also generates uh, the code for the context.xml file. So here, that's the default context.xml. It is applied repeatedly, so I figured it could be a help eventually if you have really a lot of web apps. <clears throat> and now it's time to wrap up. Yeah, and now it's time to wrap up. Uh, as you see, we have added quite a few features in the last year. I hope some will be useful to you. Obviously, the next big batch of stuff is going to be, com to be coming with Jakarta E10 and uh, Tomcat 10.1, which is going to implement brand new specifications and hopefully with exciting features. So I think I'm right on time. Yeah, so thank you very much. I'm up for questions if you have some. Thank you. So what do we have here? Did we have any questions? There was a question about the change in the manager so that we're not serializing sessions by default. Yeah. Do you recall when that change was applied? In which versions does that apply to? Uh, well, it's applied to Tomcat 10, and I don't remember which milestone, but okay, it's not but Tomcat it not 9. Apply... 9. No, so it's, oh, no it's a default change, though. So. Okay. No, but I mean, if you're not using it, you should always have been doing that because, I mean, if you're doing, going to do some maintenance at some instance, the sessions will most likely be long dead till you restart, restart it. So usually, I mean. Yes, uh, reflection works on Growl, but it's costly and you have to declare it, trace it, and it's a big mess, basically. That's what Philip did with uh, infrastructure utils. It, he, he went a bit a bit crazy by uh, getting rid of all that reflection. Uh, basically, so I didn't even think about that that being a problem, but uh, it makes the binary bigger for no real useful reason. So basically, you're making ahead of time uh, work better if you get rid of reflection altogether. So, so that's the main idea. Yes, it can, but you have to declare it. Uh, you have to declare the reflection use, and then it will make the generated binary bigger and more time consuming to generate. So it works, but it's less efficient. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, as you know, in Tomcat, I call configuration, uh, basically, uh, Philip did it for in, in the Spring Boot environment, replacing the reflection with, um, uh, with code. And basically, as uh, code generation I talked about for server.xml, it's mostly for the non-embedded use case, like the standalone use case. And that's, it's the same idea. Basically, you take uh, server.xml, which is 100% reflection from uh, SAX events, basically. And it converts that to generated code since it's uh, well, 
the data store rules are just uh, straight rules and you, you, instead of doing the reflection operation you replace that with uh, generated code and it works less as well <laughs> No, but really, it's okay. I mean, reflection is okay with Graal, but then the binary will be huge, which is okay. I mean, personally, I think it's okay. I mean, what's the, in the, like, if you static compile everything on Linux also, like, you have huge binaries and it works just fine. So why not? With ahead of time, you already have uh, plenty of ways to spend time to optimize and things so so then you start optimizing more with reflection but then it takes more effort you know so any other question before we wrap up it's already wrap up time but the sessions are only 40 minutes like uh, usually it's 50 i don't know why they also shaved off 10 minutes from the session that's odd <laughs> Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Remy. Everyone All right, so that concludes the day, I guess. So thanks for attending and see you tomorrow.